All right, well, good morning. If you will, take a songbook and stand. Turn to page 465. In his time, we'll do both verses. Of page 465, in his time. In his time, in his time, he makes all things beautiful. In his time, Lord, please show me every day as you're teaching me your way that you do just what you say in your time in your time in your time you make all things beautiful in your time lord my life to you i bring may each song i have to sing be to you a lovely thing in your time. Good to see each and every one of you this nice, warm Texas morning. And uh, it's only, what, like 40 degrees outside right now, so it's about as warm as it's going to get for the day. So uh, looking forward to Brother Bob teaching. Brother Jim, you mind opening the class in a word of prayer? Hey, thank you, Jimmy. Thank you, sir. All right, if, uh, Philippians chapter 3, if you can be turning there. Philippians chapter 3. Richard gave me this. I don't see Richard here yet. It said, I asked my surgeon, can I administer my own anesthetic? She said, sure, knock yourself out. Ephesians chapter, excuse me, Philippians. I always get those books mixed up. Philippians chapter 3. I want to talk about this morning which way we're looking, what way we're focusing on. Philippians chapter 3. We're going to start at verse 7 and read down to verse 14. Philippians chapter 3, 7 to 14. Paul's writing here, he says, But what things were gained to me, those I counted lost for Christ. Yea, doubtless I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I've suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ. And be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith, that I may know him, and the power of his resurrection, and the fellowship of his sufferings, being made conformable unto his death." If by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead, not as though I had already attained, either were already perfect, but I follow after, if that I may apprehend that for which also I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth to those things which are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus." What I want to talk about this morning is, is which way are you looking? And, and I'm basing it on verse 13 here where Paul says, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are before. This was his mentality. Um, I suppose there's three ways to look at things as far as looking horizontally. You can either look front to the forwardly, forward direction. You can look back or you can look from one side to the other. Paul said that when he's given us his focus, he says that he's looking forward. Paul is probably, when you think about the Apostle Paul, he's probably the most focused Christian that you'd ever know. And, 
And uh, it wasn't because that he didn't have a past that was a lot different, I, maybe a checkered past, but that's not all. Uh, there was a lot in Paul's past that he could have had to wrestle with if he, kept his, if he hadn't kept his focus on moving forward. In Paul's past, there was error and there was guilt. Maybe there was hatred. But there was a lot of success in Paul's past too. I was thinking about the Apostle Paul and what he did before he got saved. You reckon the Apostle Paul had a pretty good expense account? Yeah, he would travel for the Pharisees. There was a lot of money running around in those circles. He would travel for the Pharisees and he was persecuting Christians. Paul probably had a pretty comfortable life and he had a lot of powerful people that backed him and were behind him in what he was doing. So Paul had a, a really different past from what he was living from the time we know him that he got saved. You know, I, you, you're talking about which way you're looking. I remember when I got saved, I went over to Brother Mark's house about an hour after I'd gotten saved at a church here close by. And he told me this. He said, if you've truly given your life to the Lord Jesus Christ, the battle's not over, it's just beginning. And he told me if, if Satan can't keep us from getting saved, that what he'll try to do is cause us to fail as a Christian. But he, when I left, right before I left, he said this. He said, if you just keep your eyes on Jesus, you'll be fine and you'll do okay. And I found that to be true uh, going forward, just to keep my eyes on Jesus and look forward. Uh, in thinking of the matter of looking back, we're talking about which way you're looking. Let's talk about looking back first. Looking back, I'm reminded of several instances in the scripture where somebody looked back. The one I'm going to mention first is probably the one you think of best is Lot's wife. Lot's wife looked back. We read about her in Genesis chapter 19. Lot had made a a bad and a, a dangerous decision earlier, years earlier, when he decided to move in the direction of Sodom. Uh, he did it because he felt that he could do good financially there. Uh, it was common knowledge to what was going on in Sodom, but that didn't deter Lot, and that didn't slow him down. He still went anyway. And I, I think it's evidence that Lot was right. He did do well financially in Sodom. He wasn't wrong about that. It was a, a strong place financially. He did do well. And as far as finances and success go, uh, Lot cruised on pretty well for a while and things went pretty good for him. I was thinking about that when you look at Lot's life there. We seldom see the consequences of our choices immediately uh, and maybe it can be attributed to one or two things. Maybe we don't see the consequences of our choice immediately because of the wiles of the devil. Uh, he doesn't really give us the bad stuff until we're hooked real good. Or maybe it's because of the grace of God. God allows us time to come to our senses and say, hey, I've made a mistake and turned the wrong way. Anyway, Lot cruised on for a while and uh, things seemed to go okay. Uh, has God ever been good to you and allowed you to see the mistake you were making before the consequences began to really mount up? I think of before I got saved, guys, I was 17 years old, and I had gotten into some really rotten stuff, but I wasn't in trouble yet bad. And I think back of all the trouble I could have been into, and if I'd have rocked on a few years longer before I'd gotten saved and gotten into sin further than I did, I think of what all could have happened to me. And God was just gracious to me in not letting that happen to me uh, but saving me first. I appreciate God doing that. Uh, but it's always the case sooner or later, the time comes when God has to allow the fruits of sin to be reaped. So because Lot did belong to God, the Lord sent his angels to get him and his family out of Sodom. God's going to judge Sodom and Gomorrah because of the sin. But because of Lot who is who he is, God's going to get him and his family out. Now he's not successful in getting all of his family out, but the angels did get him, his wife, and his two daughters that still lived at home out of Sodom before the destruction came. But they're leaving the city and the fire's falling down from heaven and destroying it and Lot's wife looks back. She looks back. It says, but Lot's wife looked back from behind him and she became a pillar of salt. She looked back at Sodom. In the New Testament book of Luke, Jesus is speaking to people about uh, when judgment's going to come in the last days and he makes this statement. He says, remember Lot's wife. Well, why do you want to remember Lot's wife? Because she became a pillar of salt? Not really. Because she looked back is what he was trying to refer to them, because she looked back. The message was this. It was that our forsaking of the world needs to be definite, and we need to cut all the ties or all the bridges back to the world. Cut everything back. But she was enamored by what she had seen and what she had experienced in, in, in Sodom. She had lived pretty well, apparently. 
When Jesus said, remember Lot's wife, the next verse he said this. He said, whosoever shall seek to save his life shall lose it, and whosoever shall lose his life shall preserve it. So what he's saying is this. He's saying if you seek to save the life that you had, you're going to forfeit the things that you've gained. If you seek to save the life that you've had, you forfeit the things you've gained. A lot of people come to Christ and they, they want to hold on. Brother Thrift used to talk about one foot in the world and one foot in the church. They want to hold on to some things. But you've got to let those things go. You've got to let those things go and you've got to let them be in the past. Uh, wonder why Lot's wife looked back. I, I read after a fellow named William Hendrickson a lot and I really love his commentaries. He says this. He said in her scales of values... She placed earth above heaven, and she placed material things above spiritual. So she ended up, instead of leaving Sodom and leaving it behind, she ended up looking back and wanting the things that she couldn't have. You know, I was thinking, this keeps coming to my mind. I might as well go ahead and say it. When you're talking about looking back, sometimes you look back at things that were good, and sometimes you look back at things that were bad, depending on what's in your past. You know, Daddy used to say that if you wanted the good old days, all you need to do is nail up the restroom door and go open the outhouse, and you could have the good old days. So a lot of times we look back at them more fondly than maybe they were. But anyway, she looked back. There's a second group of people that look back. I've been reading through the first five books of the Bible going through this year, and I'm reading about the children of Israel and them constantly talking about what was in the past and, and what they had seen. They were, they were grown in real heavily under bondage and mistreatment by the Egyptians. It had been going on for decades that they had been being mistreated by these Egyptians. It didn't just start, it had been going on a long time. And in His grace, God sends Moses to bring them out of Egypt. And God displays one of the greatest strings of miracles in the Bible to bring them out. So they get out of Egypt and God's made Himself God in a mighty way and and it's, I think that uh, we look at things in the Bible and we don't realize the magnitude of them. The Red Sea keeps being brought up in the Old Testament when you read through here. That was a tremendous, tremendous miracle. And God showed his power to these people when he brought them out. But nonetheless, boy, when things started, it didn't take very long for discontentment to rise up even to what they'd seen, what they'd been delivered from and what they'd seen. Let me read you in Exodus chapter 14. It says they had left and gotten out of Egypt. It said, but when Pharaoh drew nigh... And the children of Israel lifted up their eyes, and behold, the Egyptians marched after them. And they were sore afraid, and the children of Israel cried out to the Lord, and they said to Moses, Because there were no graves in Egypt, have you brought us away to die in the wilderness? Wherefore hast thou dealt with us to carry us forth out of Egypt? And then they said this. They said, Is not this the word that we did tell thee in Egypt, saying, Let us alone, that we may serve the Egyptians? For it had been better for us to serve the Egyptians than we should die in this wilderness. So they're not even out as far as the Red Sea and they're feeling that way, okay? Well, that's not the only, other, only time they're going to look back. They're going to look back again. A couple of chapters later in chapter 16 of Exodus, they say, it says this. It says, The whole congregation of the children of Israel murmured against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. And they said... Would to God we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt when we sat by the flesh plots and when we did eat bread to the full. For you brought us forth into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. So then happy again. As a problem arises and, and they say, they're looking back, man, things were really good in Egypt. We really ate well in Egypt and you should have left us alone in Egypt. Well, let me give you a third time. In Numbers 14, they get to the edge of Canaan to go into Canaan the first time. And uh, they're scheduled to go in the next day or so. But they send the spies out to look at the land. And when they come back, they become afraid. And they refuse to trust the Lord for do, to do it for them what he had promised and help them defeat the people of that land. I've been reading that. And God keeps saying that these people are bigger and mightier and stronger than you. But I'm going to help you defeat them. Bigger, mightier, and stronger. But I'm going to help you defeat them. You, you say, well, how does that relate to me? I'll give you a thought. You get up to problems today. You don't have to be. People say, well, I can handle anything, and I'm this and I'm that. You need to be careful about that, but with the Lord, you can handle anything. The problem may be more than you think you can handle. It may be bigger than you think you can handle. But God told these people that it was that, but that he was going to help them handle it. And there's a ton of promises for us, the same thing in the New Testament. But anyway, they, they were upset. All the children of Israel murmured against Moses and Aaron. The whole congregation said, Would God that we had died in the land of Egypt 
Or would God we had died in the wilderness, wherefore has the Lord brought us up to this land to fall by the sword? Sounds just like the others, doesn't it? That our wives and children become a prey. Were it not better for us, they say this time, was it not better for us to return to Egypt? And they said one to another, let us make a captain and let us return to Egypt. I always thought this verse was kind of crazy. So they're, they, they're going to make a captain. Moses is not going to take them back because he's not going backwards. But they want to make a captain to take them back to Egypt. That would have been a real honorable office to be the retreat captain, wouldn't it? <laughs> this guy led you forward. Hey, we want you to help us go backwards. They wanted to make a retreat captain to help them go back to Egypt. You know, the devil and the flesh can paint things a whole lot better than they ever really were can paint things a whole lot better than they ever really were. And they're seeing this Egypt thing in a light that's just not right. But they're scared and they're fearful and so they want to go back. Why were they this way? Why did it continue to happen? It happened because of fear and unbelief. Because of fear and unbelief. As soon as any hardship reared his head or a struggle came along, they become fearful and looked back. How easily they forgot the beatings and the slavery they had experienced in Egypt. How easily they forgot the parting of the Red Sea and the other miracles they had seen that proved what God could do. And they wanted to look back. Let me ask you something. What do you do when a struggle comes? What do you do when a struggle comes? Do you ever look back? You need to remember. You need to really think about uh, what's in the past. And you remember the thing we always say, you don't choose a highway by its entrance, you choose it by its destination. You chose to follow Christ because of the destination, okay? But there's going to be some struggles along the way and there's going to be some problems along the way. And the one answer for sure that's not any good is just looking back. You know, I've heard it said that you could seldom, there's seldom uh, opportunity for a second performance, have you ever gone somewhere like you, you're going on vacation or whatever and man, you had this tremendous vacation and you went here and you did this and you did that and we want to reproduce that. How many times have you ever been able to really reproduce it? There's not many second chances on something like that. It is what it is and you can't always reproduce it like it is. And we look back and somehow the, the past is attractive to us sometimes. I've heard somebody say this a lot of times over and we said it in Sunday school. To don't doubt in the, sun, in the dark what God's shown you in the sunshine. Don't doubt in the darkness what God's shown you in the sunshine. It reminds me of the times that the, the phrase is that you feel so bold that you could feel like you could charge hell with a squirt gun. Then the next day you feel low as a snake's belly in a wagon wheel rut. And you just want to go back or go anywhere but where you're at now. You ever feel that way? I get a kick. We, we have a lot of outside salesmen at work at different places. And uh, if you've ever been in outside sales, maybe you can appreciate what I'm saying. Man, you go out some days and you go knocking on people's doors at companies and trying to sell tires, and man, things will go so good that you'll go, man, it's just a matter of time till the whole freight industry will be using Beasley Tire. We're good, man. We're the only people really doing service and everything. This is great. <laughs> you go out next week. Nobody wants to talk to you. You've lost two customers. And now you're going, it's just a matter of time till we're out of business. Nobody wants us. I say that if you're a salesman now, and I'm, I'm guilty of it, boy, high and low. High, Brian, you ever have that in your business? Everybody wants you one day. Nobody wants you the next day. Just high and low, high and low. Life's like that. Life's like that. But you've got to be careful in a Christian life particularly not to, to doubt in the darkness what God's shown you in the sunshine. Remember what God's done for you and, and what he's told you and what he's promised you. And sure, you're feeling low right now. Sure, you, and you may be discouraged right now. You may be struggling right now. But don't just throw the towel in. I was watching an old, don't, that's the only thing you can watch on movies on TV nowadays, the real older movies, you know, back in the, the old ones. I was watching an old movie Hey, I found out something, too. You remember Jethro on the Beverly Hillbillies? Y'all know who his dad was? He was a champion boxer. I think he was world heavyweight champ. Max Bear Sr. He was Max Bear Jr. Anyway, I'm, I'm helping you in Sunday school. I want you to learn some stuff, okay? So he's on this movie. And uh, this, he's on this movie, and he's uh, lost my train of thought talking about Jethro is what he was on. He, he's on the movie anyway, and he's boxing, and they're, they're talking about the former days and what could have happened and, and what really didn't happen. I totally lost my train of thought on that. That is, I, I'm going to have to quit that, but I'll get it back anyway. I'll get it back anyway. Huh? 
Yeah. You know what Jimmy told me right before Sunday school? He said, my memory, what would you tell me? Your memory is? I've got a good memory, just not very long. Yeah, he's got a good memory, just doesn't last very long. So that's where I'm at anyway. Let's talk about a third fellow a bit. Let's talk about a third fellow for a minute. Demas, everybody knows Demas. Demas followed Paul, and he worked for Paul for a period of time. Demas didn't just show up on the scene one day, but he worked for Paul. But somewhere along the line, Demas got off track. And Paul writes in 2 Timothy, he says this, he says, Demas has forsaken me, having loved this present world, and is departed into Thessalonica. Demas had served Paul and been with Paul for a long time, but he just one day just up and left Paul. And the Bible says he didn't love the present world. Well, think about Demas and, and think about what was going on. Was it persecution and the trouble of the Christian life that caused Demas to leave? Maybe it was, but that's not the whole story. It was not just what Demas wanted to leave that was the issue, but it was what he wanted to go to that was the biggest problem. He may have been having problems, but he had his eye on what he to go to. Paul said that he loved this present world. He had seen the Christian life, and he had looked back and seen the worldly life. And he bolted back to the worldly life. Was he truly a Christian? Some people think that Demas wasn't a Christian. Whether he was or not, he definitely looked back. And after gazing back, he went back after he looked and focused his attention there. So we're talking about looking back. We're talking about looking at things that happened before. Well, sometimes you don't even have to look back to cause yourself problems. You can just look from one side to the other. You know, in Old Testament, he talks about looking to the right hand, looking to the left hand. You can look to one side or another, and you can get discouraged. God's well aware of this. We read in Joshua 1, 7, this is what he told Joshua. And they were going in. These people, this is a big deal now. And these people are stronger than they are. There's no question about it. They're stronger. But he says to them, he says, Only be strong to Joshua and very courageous that you may observe to do according to the, all the law which Moses my servant commanded thee. Turn not from it to the right hand or the left that thou mayest prosper whithersoever thou goest. He says you're going to see a lot of things over here and over there, but don't turn to the right or the left. Don't get distracted. Focus your eye on what I've told you to do. I ask you this, have you ever heard of distracted driving? Everybody's heard of distracted driving. What do you think these days the main culprit to distracted driving? <laughs> Text and cell phones. You can tell if you're driving down the road and this dude slows down and he speeds up and if he's weaving in his lane, 90% of the time what's happening? He's on his phone, boy. You can drive up beside him. He's on his phone. Then when he gets off the phone, he takes off. You're distracted. you you got your mind on something else. It causes a lot of accidents. Let me ask you this. Have you ever looked, you're driving down the road and you see this building or you see this fine car or this big truck that's overloaded or whatever and you're looking at it and the next thing you know you find yourself halfway in your lane and out of the lane? What happened? You look to the right or you look to the left and you looked off and now you're not gonna, going straight anymore. You're out of the path you ought to be in. I was thinking about this when I was studying and it reminded me of Pilgrim in Pilgrim's Progress. And I want to read you a little excerpt uh, of Pilgrim. Now you know John Bunyan wrote Pilgrim's Progress while he was in prison. It's an allegory of the Christian life. The guy, the main guy is a fellow named Christian and he left his, his city to go to the celestial city and he gets saved along the way uh, and the rest of it's an allegory about the people he meets along the way and what happens. Let me read you a little bit. It says, then Christian and Hopeful, he had a good friend named Hopeful. Then Christian and Hopeful outwent them again and went until they came to a delicate plain called Ease. That's what the plain was called, ease, where they went with much content. But that plain was but narrow, so they were quickly got over it. Now at the further side of that plain was a little hill called Lucre, and in that hill a silver mine, which some of them that had formerly gone that way because of the rarity of it had turned aside to see it. But going too near the brink of the pit, the ground being deceitful under them broke, and they were slain. Some had also been maimed there, and could not to their dying day be their own man again. Now he's making an allegory. This pit is called lucre, money. It, money's distracting him, okay? He says, Then I saw in my dream that a little off the road, over against the silver mine, stood Demas to call passengers to come and see, who said to Christian and to his fellows, Ho, aside hither, and I will show you a thing. Christian said, What thing so deserving as to turn us out of the way? Demas, here is a silver mine and some digging in it for treasure. And if you will come with a little pains, you may richly provide for yourselves. Hope, 
Then said Hopeful, let us go see. Christian, not I, said Christian. I've heard of this place before now and how many there have been slain. And besides that, treasure is a snare to those who seek for it. It hindereth them in their pilgrimage. Then Christian called to Demas, saying, Is not this place dangerous? Has it not, been, has it not men, hindered many in their pilgrimage? Demas, not very dangerous, except to those that are careless. But with all he blushed as he spoke. Christian then said, Christian to Hopeful, let us not stir a step, but let us keep on the way. Hopeful said, well, I will warrant you that when buy-ins, this is another man named buy-ins, when buy-ins comes up, if he has the same invitation as we, he will turn in here to the sea. Christian, no doubt thereof, for his principles lead him that way, and a hundred to one, but that he dies there. Demas, or Demas says, and Demas called again, saying, but will you not just come over and see you know, that's what the devil wants you to do. That's the first step he wants you to do. Just look at it. Is it really that bad? Or is it really that good? Or is that what it's really like? He said, just come over and see. Then Christian roundly answered, saying, Demas, thou art an enemy to the right ways of the Lord and of this way. And thou hast, already, thou hast been already condemned for thine own turning aside but one of his majesty, by one of his majesty's judges. And why seest thou to break us into the like condemnation? Besides, if we all turn aside, our Lord the King will certainly hear thereof and will there put us to shame, where we, st where we would not be able to stand with boldness before him. Demas cried again that he also was one of their fraternity. And if they would tarry a little, he also himself would like to walk with them. Demas says, hey, I'm a Christian like you. And he said, I'll come over here and let's visit a while and then I'll walk with you a little ways. Then Christian said, what is thy name? Is it not the same by which I've called thee? He said, yes, my name is Demas. I'm a son of Abraham. Christian said, I know you. Gehazi was your great-grandfather and Judas your father, and you've trod their steps. <clears throat> it is but a devilish prank that thou usest thy father. Excuse me. It was but a devilish prank that thou usest. Thy father was hanged for a traitor, and thou deservest no better reward. Assure thyself that when we come to the king, we will do him word of this thy behavior. Thus they went on their way. By this time, Bians and his companions were come again within sight, and they at first beck went over to Demas. Now whether they fell into the pit by looking over the brink thereof, or whether they went down to dig, or whether they were smothered in the bottom by the damps that commonly arise out of those things, I'm not certain. But this I observed, that they never were seen again in the way. Then saying, Christian, Buy-ins and Silver Demas both agree. One calls, the other runs, that he may be a sharer in his lucre. So these two take up in this world and go no further. What are you talking about? You're talking about trying to be deterred, deterred and try to get you to turn aside. Look back. The devil wants you to look back a lot of times. If he can't get you to look back, he'll want you to look over here and look over here. Let's check this out. Just check that out. Just look over here. Look over there. And that was what Christian did all the way to the celestial city. He had things that this side attracted him from that side attracting him. Just trying to get him off the way. Just trying to get him off the way. Well, it's not the only time that Christian was turned and tempted to look back. He's going to come to a fellow in a few minutes called, or, or a place in a minute called Bypath Meadow. And he's going to be tempted to look away. It's a real beautiful meadow, and it's by the path. It's called Bypath Meadow. And he's going to be tempted to look away again. You're going to be tempted to do the same thing. I'm going to be tempted to do the same thing. Look back at something the devil said was better. Look to the side at something the devil says is better. And you need to be ready, and you need to be aware of how he works. We need to be not ignorant of his devices. Uh, <laughs> let me ask ourselves something. Why would you want to look back or look away? Think about it as a Christian. Why would you want to look back or look away? I remember when I got saved, how I was living uh, like I wanted to, and I was living without a conscience toward God. I was doing just what I wanted to do. But God brought me under conviction, and, and, and with my eyes wide open, I left that way and came to Jesus. With my eyes wide open as to all the way I had been living, it wasn't worth not coming to Christ. And I turned from that and followed Jesus. Sin was what, not worth losing my own soul for, and it was not worth waiting for the consequences to come upon me. And when I began to get under conviction of sin and I realized that I had no eternal future, 
and I realized that the consequences of my sin were coming upon me, I made a decision to follow Christ. Nobody made me. Nobody forced me. Same's true for you. Nobody made you. Nobody forced you. You made a decision to follow Christ. Well, if that's the case, how can I be tempted to see it any different now? Is sin any better than it was when I left to follow Christ? Has sin improved over the years? It's been 30 Eight years now, 39 years this summer. It'll be 40 years next year. Is sin any better than when I left it to choose Christ? If it was so great, why did I choose Christ? Because I could see. I had eyes to see all of a sudden and ears to hear, and I could see. Does the world have more lasting promise today than it had when we forsook it to follow Christ? I don't think so. I don't think it's any better than it was. Let me give you three things. I want to finish up with three thoughts regarding what our focus should be, and I'll be finished. Look at the first one. Jesus said this. Jesus said, no man having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. Jesus was calling some men to follow him in the book of Luke, but they each had a reason why they couldn't follow him. They were looking back at other things that were more important to do right now than to follow Jesus, and Jesus made that statement. He said, no man looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. Uh, William Hendrickson again, let me read you what he says here. He said, the man who puts his hand to a plow and then starts plowing forward, but then immediately looks back and continues to do so, constantly trying to plow forward while he looks behind him, cannot run a straight furrow. It is entirely proper for him to stop his plow and then while standing still to view what he has done in order to correct mistakes, but to plow in one direction while looking in the other direction will never do. This is what he's talking about. You say, I should never look back. No, there's times to look back, like Hendrickson is saying here. There's times to stop and to look back. I think you can look back for two reasons. I think you can look back. They say if you don't learn anything from history, you're bound to repeat it. I think you can look back and look what things have happened in your life and go, boy, I really learned something there. Can you do that? I'm sure you can. Boy, did I learn something there. Man, did I see something there. I don't want to do that again. Or you can stop and look back in your life and you go, boy, God blessed me there. God said that was the way it should be, and I listened, and man, did things go good there. And so you can look back and, and assess that, and you can think of the good things, the bad things, what you've learned, what you've seen, what you've enjoyed. But then you need to get on back and let's move on with life. You can't live in yesterday. You can't live in yesterday. I think about this a lot concerning our country. That, that's a big subject right now. And, and we talk about it. And if you're not careful, you'll spend all your time talking about yesterday, about what it used to be like and what you used to could do and the way it used to be and all that. All that's true. All that's true. But all that's used to be. All that's the way it was then. That's not going to help you live for now. We're going to have to find out what it is now that God wants us to do and what God's agenda is now and move forward. And move forward. The way you move forward may not be. It, it'll be the same as a godly direction. But there will be different things you'll have to focus on and do to, to move forward in a right way. God's moving us in a little bit different direction. And looking back is only good for yesterday. You, you can only look forward and say, okay, God, what, does you want, what do you want me to do from here? I remember Daddy used to say, I, I talk about my dad a lot. Uh, I remember something was happening and... Uh, I said, well, Dad, what in the world are we going to do? What are we going to do? He said, I'll tell you what we're going to do, son. He said, we're going to finish up today, and we're going to lock the door, and then we're going to go home and eat a real good supper, and we're going to go to bed, and we're going to sleep real good, then we're going to come back tomorrow and get on this thing again. That's what we're going to do. And that's pretty good advice. That's pretty good advice. You can't look backward. You just got to look forward. What's God put in your path? What does God want you to do? What is it today? Life would get pretty boring if it was always the same thing. So the look is the forward look. Let me do the second thing. What we focus our gaze on captures our mind. You really need to think about this one. What we focus our gaze on captures our mind. Whatever we choose to focus our gaze on will begin to control our thoughts so one of the Bible says, as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. You think this way, you think this way, you think this way, you'll be that way. Because that's what you say. That's all you see. It, it consumes you, okay? As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. You'll become whatever you focus your thoughts upon. You may not think so, and you may seek to be something else as long as you can, as long as you can, but your life will mirror your thoughts eventually. If that's where your mind is, that's where your life's going to go. It's where your life's going to go. Uh, the writer of Proverbs says this to us. He says, keep your heart with all diligence, 
For out of it are the issues of life. That word heart is sometimes translated mind in the body, in the Bible. Keep your heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. The heart and the mind determine our speech and they determine our actions. What's going on in here? In my heart and my mind determine my speech and my actions. For later on we're told out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaketh. The only thing you can put out is what's in side, you know. And so out of the abundance of the heart mouth speaketh. Jesus said that. He said he's telling us whatever captures our mind's attention captures our heart and will eventually come out. So you've got to think about what you think on. I believe this. I believe the greatest discipline is the discipline of the mind. Okay? The greatest discipline is the discipline of the mind. To discipline our mind, you've got to bring your thoughts in captivity to the obedience of the Lord Jesus Christ. I read a book here lately in the last few months, maybe in the last year, uh, talking about your thought life and, and how to control your thought life. And that was one of the big verses that they used, bringing every thought in captivity to the obedience of the Lord Jesus Christ. You're having thoughts that want to look back and thoughts of discontentment, thoughts of looking over this way and looking over that way. How do you get rid of those thoughts? You discipline your mind by bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Jesus Christ. I'll be cruising along some days. You don't ever get a bad attitude, do you? Let me tell you what it's like, so in case you do, you'll kind of be familiar with it. I'll be cruising along sometimes, and I'll get a bad attitude about something, and I'll be getting worked up about it. And I'll, it'll dawn on me what's happening to me. And it seems like you can't stop thinking about it. You ever get that way? Your mind churns and churns on the same old jump. Churns and churns on the same old jump. And this verse has helped me a lot since these guys brought it out in the book. I, I'll go, no. Remember, bring every thought into captivity to the obedience of Jesus Christ. Well, I think that. And I bring it to the obedience of Jesus Christ. It basically has to go because God doesn't want anything to do with that. That's not him talking to me. And to bring it into captivity. The greatest discipline is the discipline of the mind. To keep right thoughts, you've got to keep from allowing your gaze to feed your mind on destructive information and visions. You know, you can hang around people that are scared to death and they're pessimists and you won't do anything. You'll be afraid to go to work the next morning. Or you can hang around people that are optimists. You go, I don't like those optimists. They're always dreaming and they're naive. Well, I guess you can go too far, but do you want to be a negative person? No. Uh, you can hang around optimists and they can make you believe you can do all kinds of things. Uh, I had a brother-in-law that's dead now, Don. Uh, a lot of y'all used to know Don. Don was a crazy outlaw. He was something. He wouldn't mind me saying that, and if he didn't mind it, he couldn't deny it. Don was crazy. But you know, Don provoked me to do things that I thought I never could do. Boy, it'd be something at a deer lease or something with some equipment or something about this. And I'd be honest, and I can have, you can't do that. And he'd go, no, I think we can do it. I think we can do this or that. And next thing you know, we've done it and, and had it fixed. Having people with a mindset like that around you about certain things is good for you. It's good for you to keep your, your thoughts positive instead of keep them negative. Whatever captions your mind's attention is going to capture your heart is what it is. If you, if you look back and you think negative and you constantly entertain worldly thoughts, your mind is going to follow and it's going to go there. It's going to follow and it's going to go there. So remember, the greatest discipline is the discipline of the mind. Watch what you're thinking. And when you, when you realize you're going down that path, bring that thought into captivity to the obedience of the Lord Jesus Christ and let it go and think on something else. You say, well, where are you going to get Bible for that, Bob? Well, I can't tell you where the verse is, but what did Paul say? Think on these things, whatever good, whatever thing is just, what's honorable, what's pure. He tells you to do that, and, and you need to focus your mind there. You need to focus your mind there. Let me give you the last one, the third one. We need to look forward. We need to look forward. Jonathan Thrift was here the last week, the last couple of weeks ago. You know, I really, seeing Jonathan encourages me, because I knew his dad, Jack, and to see Jonathan serving the Lord like that, <clears throat> see his sister serving the Lord like that, that's just kind of cool, you know, to see them following their dad's footsteps. But remember that song that they sing, Don't Look Back? The lyrics say, don't look back, only look to the Lord. Don't turn around, just press forward. Keep your hands upon the sword. There's nothing left behind you. Everything's been burnt with fire. Press forward to the life that's kept by God's preserving power. Don't look back. You know what he's talking about on that line? He said, there's nothing left behind you. Everything's been burnt with fire. You got any idea who he's referring to? Elisha. 
He told Elijah, Elijah told Elisha to follow him. And he was plowing with 12 yoke of oxen with a bunch of other people plowing. And what Elisha did, he took his plow and he burned it up, used it for a fire, sacrificed the oxen on the fire. And uh, he didn't have a plow to go back to. And he didn't have an ox to go back to. And this is what he's using in the song. He said, there's nothing left behind you. Everything's been burnt with fire. Elisha burned his bridges. So if he thought about looking back, it was no bridge to cross. He didn't have anything to go back to. You know, it reminds me of, I believe it was Will Borden. And, and Will Borden, you've heard his name before. It wasn't Borden's milk people. He was from another wealthy family. But God called him to be a missionary. And he gave all his money away. And if I remember right, it was either he or C.T. Studd, one, gave it to the Salvation Army, George Mueller, and maybe Moody Bible Institute or whatever, gave all their fortune away. And when they left, they wrote uh, no reserves, I think, in his Bible. He wrote no reserves. And uh, there's three things he wrote, no reserves, and later on he wrote no regret and, and something else. But he gave all his money away, so he didn't have any reserves to go back to anyway. And later on in his life, he said he didn't have any regrets about doing it, that he was glad that he did. Paul said this, he said, reaching forward to those things that are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God. Paul could have been beat up by the fact that he was a murderer before he got saved, but he let that go. He believed God forgave him. Paul could have been beat up by the fact that if you, remember how we talked about a few months ago, how Paul, all the things he went through in fastings often, he didn't have enough, he didn't have this, he didn't have that. He basically was almost like Jesus. He didn't have any place to lay his head. Paul could have been looking back at, to the time when he was a member of the Sanhedrin, and he had plenty. But Paul had let that go. That was the former life. And Paul had let that go, and he was reaching forward to the things that are before uh, Moses had a tough time. Moses didn't even sign up for his job. He got drafted. Moses had a tough time. Do you remember how Moses endured what the Bible said helped him endure? He endured as seeing him who is invisible. That's what he said. He endured as seeing him who is invisible. Moses looked ahead by faith and he could see God. In an earlier verse, we're told that, that he had respect to the reward that was before him. He could see ahead, he had discretion, and he could see the real reward that was waiting for him if he followed the Lord. Now the people around him were always looking back. Man, that had to be discouraging, didn't it? That's your whole staff. And they're all discouraged and they're all looking back. The people around him were always uh, looking around them and they were looking back, but Moses was looking ahead. It really takes a discipline of the mind to look ahead when your wife, your husband, your kids, your employees, your friends are all looking back. It really takes a discipline to move forward when everybody else is looking another way. I, I was thinking about Moses. I don't know how many like-minded people that he had around him, but he had two like-minded people around him. Anybody remember who they were? Joshua and Caleb. And then her, I think, held his arms up. We know him, too, held his arms up while they were in a battle. So he had two or three around him. And it may be like that for you. You may not have a whole lot of emotional support around. Maybe you need to be the emotional support. Maybe I need to be the, mo the one to lead out and say, hey, hey, we can do this. We can do this. God's with us. A verse we all know and we like to quote is Romans 8, 28. He says, we know that all things work together for good to them that love God. Uh, there's not much reason to dwell too long on the things that are going around us in our lives except we're going to learn from them. If I'm struggling, if I'm struggling through some period of time, the answer is not to look back or to bolt and run. Do I believe that God is working all things in my life? All things, he said. Do I believe that God's working all things in my life? Does he allow them in my life? Does he put them there? Well, he says in this verse that if he does, that he's working them to his purpose in us. Now, I had some things happen to me lately. And I'm not a whiner. I, I just don't think too much about why did this happen to me. It just doesn't come to my mind. But I've had some things go on lately, and I thought, man, man, <laughs> why? why I'll be glad when this is gone. Good grief. You ever think that way? And then the thought comes to me. It says, well, God allowed it in your life. Apparently, it's for a purpose. And I'm thinking, well, God, you don't understand. Uh, I, I, I know one person... Uh, we've talked about before, every time you tell them something, they go, well, I really needed that. <laughs> you know, whatever. Well, apparently we did. Apparently we did. Apparently God thought that we needed it. I was never in the Marines. I was kind of glad. I thought I wanted to join the Marines at one time. It might have made me a better guy. 
Can you imagine being a Marine, waking up one morning, God tells you instead of waking up at 5, he wakes you up at 3. You go, why are you waking me up at 3? So we're going to do this march, get your stuff on, we're going to do this and such. You go, why we need to do that? I saw some Navy SEALs one time down south of San Diego. We were, we were down there at a meeting. And they came across in a, in a boat onto the bank right there by the big hotel. They got out of the boat. I can't remember what all they did. You remember, honey, don't you? They got out of the boat, and they were in full gear. And they, they laid down in the water and got wet, and then they got up and started running doing this. And they carried the boat up on the beach. Man, it was cold. All that water in California is cold all the time. And they're carrying that boat up on the beach. I'm thinking, dude, man, all the sand on you now, you're wet. You imagine being one of them. You think, why in the world are we doing this? And the guy said, well, by the time I get you through doing some of this, you're going to be able to do anything. You're going to be able to do anything. You're not going to understand all the time why things are going on, but do you believe that there's a greater purpose in your life and that you can look forward? Don't get caught looking back, wishing for yesterday. Don't get caught looking back. Look forward. God's working Stuff in your life. God's working them, he says here, for good in your life. You say, well, that's a bad thing. You ever had a coach grab you? You ever play ball and a coach grab you and start yelling at you and ask me what's wrong with you? And you go, uh, I don't know what's wrong with me, coach. You know, He's tearing you up, you know, and your mother's sitting over there in the stands going, that's my boy. And you go to the locker, you go, why would he do that to me? I had a guy tell me one time, I was in college, and I couldn't afford to pay the bill. I ran short of money, but I was going to trust the Lord. I still trust the Lord, but it sure didn't work out like I thought. I went in there to pay my bill. And when I didn't have the money, they made me go talk to the main guy. So I went and talked to the main guy, and after it was all over, you know what he told me? Because I had had a good job and all this stuff, and I should have had the money. He, and I had given the money in ministry. I had given the money in ministry. He looked at me, and he said, well, let me tell you something, son. That was my other name, son. So he'll tell you something, son. He said, I'm going to let you back in school. But he said, if you owe this school a penny at the end of the semester, I suggest you find yourself another school. Dude, this is a Christian college. I'm paying to go. I was paying until I ran out of money. I'm paying to go here. And you're going to tell me not to come back? That was me. Guess what? I never own the money anymore. I don't remember anybody that I've owed money late anymore. I got the message, man. You can't give away what belongs to somebody else. You've got to pay them if you said you're going to. But it was a good lesson, but it wasn't pleasant at the time. Things happen in our lives. Things happen in our lives. And God says here that they're for good. They're not good at the time to us as we see good. They're not good at the time, but they work together for our good. Do I believe that God's orchestrating my life? Do I believe that God allowed everything that's happening to come into my life? Do I know why? Maybe not. Probably not. Just lay low and trust God and move forward. Isn't that what Ronnie Barefield said, Lee? Don't move, don't go back, go forward. Lee always reminds me of that. Don't go back, go forward. Don't, don't look back, go forward and understand that God knows what he's doing. He's working his purpose in us. And the truth of the matter is you've got a lot to look forward to as a Christian. You got a lot to look forward to. Remember when Paul was on that ship and they were shipwrecked and they thought they were all going to die? And Paul said, hey, he said, be of good cheer. The Lord appeared to me this night. And he said, we're, none of us are going to perish. The Lord's going to save us all alive. The ship's going to be there. And, and uh, so they, some of them believed Paul. I think the most part maybe believed Paul. Paul could see, God showed him that that ship, they were going to be able to be shipwrecked, but they were going to be able to get to the shore and they were going to be able to go on to Rome. God's made you promises. You're going to get to the other side. And the other side is tremendous. I was just watching John Hagee preach about the other side this morning. He had his little chart going on on this board, a thousand years of millennium. And he had over here the new heaven and the new earth. Things are looking pretty good for you. Now, it's not today. Well, it might be. But you don't have to guarantee it's today. And maybe not tomorrow, but things are looking pretty good for you. You've got a lot to look forward to as a Christian. Let's don't lose our focus because better days are ahead as a Christian. I hear him say, a president is real popular for a president to say that our country's best days are yet to come. Well, I'm not sure about that, but I know a Christian's best days are yet to come. There's no question about that, so I want to look forward. That's what we want to do. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the word of God. Help us to be motivated, Father, to trust you, to trust you, God. That's a hard word uh, to realize the depth of it, Father. Do we trust you or do we not trust you, Father? Help me to trust you, Lord. I want to. 
Help us all to trust you, Father. Help us to believe your word. Help us to take a lot of your word in, Father, so there's much of it inside of us to draw upon. And uh, help us to trust you. Help us not spend a lot of time looking back. Help us not to yell to the voices from one side or the other. But help us just to go forward with Jesus, Father, because we look forward to seeing you one day. And we want you to be pleased with us when we arrive. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.